Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Dean Show. He's back again, Dr. Bilal Phillips, to help clear that way. There's some confusion out there. There are many ways calling people saying that they're the correct way. So how does one differentiate the true way of life, the true religion, the true way to be successful from all these thousands, hundreds of ways saying that they're the way? So when he comes out, we're going to try to answer this very crucial question here on The Dean Show. You don't want to go nowhere. We'll be right back. There's only one God and Muhammad is his messenger Allah, la ilaha illallah Allah, there's only one God and Jesus was his messenger Allah, la ilaha illallah I don't know why I did that, maybe it's just, maybe it's just to break the ice Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Back again on the Dean Show. My pleasure to be back. All right. Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much. My pleasure. People can read about you at thedeanshow.com. You have your own private section. Is that right? That's right. Oh, has Allah. your picture there, and they click on the picture, and your bio is there, and the show that we did, Purpose of Life. That's a crucial question. But another question is people are like, you know what? Religions are all the same. They're man-made. I'll just do my own thing. How does one differentiate the true way of life? If one has already acknowledged what's in his very nature, that there's a creator. But now you have all these different isms, these different ways. How do you differentiate what is the true way? The true way to success, happiness, peace, and the pleasure of the creator of the heavens and earth. Talk to us, please. Well, if we're to find the true way, we have to believe, of course, that this true way must have come from God. So... If it's coming from God, it must have what we call a scriptural basis. Mm -hmm. There should be a scripture there. And then that scripture should be one in which there is no doubt. No doubt. No doubt about the authenticity of its text, its origin, the protection of that text from any change or modification, so that we know what is in our hands was what was revealed. Mm -hmm. Then we know we have a religion whose basis, whose foundation is solid. Otherwise, if the document that is claimed to be the origin is something which they've got so many different manuscripts of and no two manuscripts agree with each other, like the Gospels, for example, yeah. there are over 5,000 manuscripts. Mm -hmm. No two manuscripts agree in all details with each other. And at present, we have something like 5,500 manuscripts in Greek of the New Testament, which is a lot for an ancient book. It's far more than any other ancient book. The problem is most of these copies are hundreds and hundreds of years after the originals, and all of them have differences in them. Uh, so that the scribes who were copying these manuscripts changed the text that they were copying, uh, sometimes by accident. I mean, sometimes they just made mistakes. They were sleepy or incompetent or whatever. But sometimes it looks like scribes actually thought the text should say something other than it did, and then they, so they would change the text. So then which one's right? How do you figure it out? Yeah. You know, or the Gita or the, you know, scriptures of the Hindus and others, you know, when they were written, they have no idea, bits and pieces here and there, you know. It's of uncertain origin. Who wrote? They don't know. Clouded. Clouded in, in, in confusion and uncertainty. Yeah. So when you have texts like that, I mean, even the, the Old Testament, which mm -hmm. may be a little more accurate and more solid than the New Testament writings, but even that, the scholars of scriptural crypt criticism have shown contradictions that exist in it. Uh, some places it looks like it's a manipulation of the text, where, where the author wants to change, where, where the scribe wants to change what the author said. I mean, in many cases it may be that the scribe thought this is what the author really meant, and so he changed it. But, uh, but sometimes the, the text gets changed to say just the opposite of what it originally said. And so uh, that's, uh, that, that can be a little bit troubling, yeah. Different documents which are being used, stories which are being repeated and, you know, in different ways and all kinds of doubts there. Yeah. You have doubts. So we can distinguish. We, we just have to put the, the basic scriptures on the table and say, like, which one we can be 100% sure about. And that's the Quran. 
The yeah. evidence is there. It speaks for itself. So it can't happen. That is external. Yeah. That's from an external perspective. Yeah. Then internally, uh -huh. what does that text contain? Yeah. Now, is that text, if it's from God, it should contain accurate information. It shouldn't have fallacies and, you know, uh, contradictions with modern science and these kinds of things. When you pick up the other texts and you read in there, maybe you might find some interesting things here and there, but there's a lot of old wives' tales which don't agree with what we know about science today. Yeah. Whereas when you go in the Quran, you go from chapter to chapter, when you look at scientific things which are talked about in the Quran, they match modern scientific theory. So much so that when the verses were shown to uh, Dr. Keith Moore, who writ wrote the book on embryology, Yeah. Right? The book used in all of the medical colleges around the world. They showed him these verses from the Quran which described the development of the fetus at a time when it's not visible to the naked eye. He said, Muhammad could not have known these facts about human development in the 7th century because most of them were not discovered until the 20th century. That God transmitted through Muhammad bits of his knowledge that we have only discovered for ourselves in recent times. 1,400 years ago, when the world was immersed in darkness, the Quran was revealed, which brought light to a beleaguered world. And whereas the earlier books came with many scientific mistakes due to the hand of man having delved into them, the Quran had none of these contradictions. The world thought there could be no reconciliation between religion and science. But the Quran mentioned many scientific facts in great detail, like how a human being developed in the mother's womb, and described other scientific facts which amaze the world's renowned scientists and scientific community. This could not have come from Muhammad. So they said, then where did it come from? It must have come from God, no doubt. Not possible to describe what is there when the microscope wasn't developed until many centuries after him. Yeah. This is the evidence. These are concrete bits and pieces of evidence that's internal. You have external and you have internal. And then the overall message which is being taught. I mean, it's not a whole bunch of fairy tales, wild, fantastic tales things which seem to match the realities of this life. You read the Quran, this is God talking to you directly. So now, so a person doesn't have to go deep into, let's say, Buddhism, Christianity, or any kind of Hindu religion, or all the Sikhism. Now, at the face of it, so they're looking for contradictions, mistakes, things that are unrational. What are they actually looking for? These are some of the things that you mentioned that it has to be, the message has to be lucid, clear, something that is basically not flawed by man. And then if it is, leave it alone, go to the next. Does Islam encourage that you look at these different ways and you'll come to realization, if you're sincere and you're asking the Creator to guide you, that you'll eventually end up back to this way, the way of all the prophets, Islam? If a person is sincere, God is going to guide them. Yeah. That's for sure, if they're sincere. But they have to be ready to act then on the knowledge that they get from this. The mm -hmm. problem is that a lot of people may come and realize, yes, the truth is there with Islam. Yeah. But to take that on, what is involved in, in becoming a Muslim, creates such problems in families, you know, how parents are going to react, how the wife and the kids and, you know, or the husband and the, the kids, and how are they going to react? How am I going to deal with so all of this? Some problem. people say, hey, too much. That's the real issue. I, I, I like what you have. Yeah. It makes <laughs> sense. It's very good. <laughs> but I'm just not ready to deal with the consequences. Consequences, yeah. And that's sad. Because one cannot afford, once you seek the truth, you know, as it's mentioned in the Bible, that the truth is going to set you free. It's mm -hmm. true. Set you free from ignorance. Bring you to the realization of the true God. So once you're there, for you to turn aside and say, well, because of people, I can't deal with this. That's a big mistake. That is the most serious possible mistake that you can make in your life. To have known the truth in its clarity 
with certainty and turned away. What can we say after that? Yeah. So d does it seem like these other religions, ways, are just things because the inside of a person is searching, yearning for something. So this is convenient now. The other vi religions, you can just modify them to your way. It can just, you can uh, put it in and it doesn't have to inconvenience you or something. But yeah, Islam, it's easy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it doesn't require that much commitment. Yeah. You know, you can do it once a week or, you know, when you feel like, you know, it's, 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 uh, uh, they say fast food, like yeah. fast food, you know. <laughs> So it's not, it's not a real change where to become a Muslim requires major change. It requires taking on a commitment 24-7. 24-7. Yeah, there's no part-time Muslim. I mean, of course, there are people who might do Islam part-time, but that's not real Islam. Real Islam requires 24-7 commitment. Mm -hmm. There's no time when you take a vacation from Islam. Yeah. yeah, so that Islam that we're talking about, we're talking about that complete conscious decision that I'm going to surrender, I'm going to submit, I'm going to be obedient to the one who created me. And this is summed up with one word in Arabic, Islam. Exactly. Yeah, Submission so to the will of God. Some people get hung up now on the Arabic now. They feel that possibly, look, this is, this is an Arab thing. This is an Arabic thing. How do we have them look past this? Well, reality is that the followers of the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, came from all parts of the world. We had them coming from Persia, coming from Abyssinia, coming from all over, you know, from, right from his generation. And reality is, is that the vast majority of Muslims in the world are not Arabs. Arabs only make up a fraction, 15% of the whole of the Muslim nation, you know, yeah. 1.5 billion people. Arabs are only a fraction. The total number of, of Muslims in India alone is more than the total number of Arabs. So it's not an Arabic religion. It becomes, But okay, Arabic is there. But this Arabic is a unifier. So that... The nature of our prayer is such that no matter where you go, you can join in your brothers and sisters with them in prayer. Yeah. You know, I go to China. If you heard the Adhan in Chinese, well, then you wouldn't even know what's going on, the call to prayer. Yeah. But when you hear it in Arabic, you know exactly wherever you are. Any Muslim hears that, they know there's a mosque here. You go in there, the guy's going to lead the prayer. He's, he does it in Chinese. Again, you're lost. What is he doing? What is he saying? Yeah. He speaks in Arabic. Everybody can fall in and it's the unifying factor. And again, it is also the language of revelation. The language in which God revealed his final message. So you learn Arabic, not to be an Arab, but to be able to hear the word of God as it was revealed. I mean, Jesus spoke Aramaic. The gospel that he received was in Aramaic. But there are tribes in in, in Syria today, that speak Aramaic. He didn't speak English. He didn't speak English. He didn't speak Latin, yeah. you know, from which, or Greek, from which these things were translated. He spoke Aramaic. So where is his gospel? It's lost. Not known. Was it now meant for a particular time, a particular people, and now we don't have it because some people would argue that, well, did God make a mistake now because this is supposed to be for for all of us until today so now how did this how do we lose it now did god make a mistake or was it meant to be saved well there's no there's no mistake here because of the fact that jesus's message was for as you said a particular people in a particular place for a particular period of time a prophet was going to come after him who would bring the final message which would be for all people in all places at all times. So all of the earlier prophets, the scriptures were not guarded and preserved by God as he guarded and preserved the Quran. Not because they were not scripture. Yes, they're all scripture. In that sense, they're all equal. They're all the word of God conveyed to human beings. But the changes that took place by human hands to the earlier scriptures, God permitted because those messages were not eternal messages. They were messages for particular people, particular places, particular times. Yes. So the final message, if it were to be the final message, it had to be preserved. 
And that's again evidence of its truthfulness and finality. Do we still have the word of the Creator in what we have of the Bible today? We have bits and pieces. Bits and pieces? Yeah, bits and pieces here and there. And these are affirmed in the Quran. There are many places which affirm texts from the Bible. But the, the totality of what's there is confusion. For a long time I thought that the Bible was inspired and inerrant, that there were no mistakes in the Bible. But as I engaged in historical research on the Bible, as I was getting my PhD in New Testament studies at Princeton Theological Seminary, I started finding mistakes in the Bible. And uh, this, this cut away at my assumptions that the Bible was inerrant. And then I started questioning other parts of my faith. Is Jesus really divine? Uh, is there really a trinity? Mm -hmm. It's confusion. But a person who reads it sincerely from beginning to end, he will be forced to accept the oneness of God because that message is there. In spite of all the distortions and all the other things that are there, the oneness of God is there. All of the earlier prophets talking oneness of God. And Jesus affirming when they asked him, what is the... The command, God's command. He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. One God. He's affirming the same thing that came before. So anybody who reads that says, Okay, well, where did the Trinity thing come from? Yeah. It definitely is not in the text. Mm -hmm. You know, this is something people added. You know, what is the text now which is clear? Oneness of God is crystal clear. It's the Quran. Now, if we take what is meant for a people at that time, and people saying the Son of God, because many people believe that Jesus was God, Son of God, there's a bunch of confusion here. They have to do a bunch of mental gymnastics to make it fit. But now if you take this, what's meant is it that he was a righteous, upright person, close to God. But if you take this out and you take it now to, let's say, the Greeks who are worshiping demigods, semi-gods, this God, that God, can, you, can that be where a lot of the confusion came, where now they take what is meant for that time and is understood, and now you bring it over to another totally pagan society and they're already worshiping man gods and now we have what we have today modern day man worship Jesus is a son son of God well definitely I mean this is a uh, one of the explanations of the process of what took place yeah I mean of course the message of Jesus was crystal clear clear it had to be crystal clear because if it's coming from God the clarity is going to be there and it remained clear, but what happened is that when it was taken out of the, the, we could say the East, and it came now into the West, then these changes took place. Whether it was a question of interpreting or misinterpreting earlier texts, or really introducing ideas which were never in the original texts, mm -hmm which I, I feel is probably more of that than actually misinterpretation. Because misinterpretation sort of implies that the message wasn't that clear. Mm -hmm. Whereas I don't believe that's the case. In fact, the message of Jesus was very clear. In fact, after Jesus left, as they thought he was killed or whatever, you know, but when Jesus went away, the one who came behind him, who became the head of the Jerusalem church is none other than James, who is called in the Gospels, the brother of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And James, as the head of the Jerusalem church, taught that Jesus was a prophet of God. God was one. He was a Unitarian. He wasn't a Trinitarian. So it wasn't un for, that, for those, that period of almost like 70 years after the time of Jesus, that was the main church. The Jerusalem church was a Unitarian church preaching the message of the one God. And that Jesus was a human being and a prophet of God who was sent to convey this message. But with the dispersion of the, the Jews, the breakup of the Temple of Solomon, Jews being dispersed from Jerusalem, and of course, the, the Muslims, or we could say the Judeo-Christians of that time, uh, who were those who truly followed Jesus, externally they wouldn't look any different from the regular Jews. So when they dispersed, everybody had to disperse. So the Jerusalem church, which was the main 
me, uh, core center from which the teachings, the true teachings of Jesus were being taught, that was destroyed and people had to flee. So when that was lost, then the center in Antioch, which was headed by Paul, mm -hmm. right? Paul now took over the movement and he started, he had already been doing it earlier, now he was given a full clear hand, James is assassinated, he has the full clear hand to change the message and preach the new religion, which he called Christianity. Which obviously Jesus, his followers, they never taught. Never taught, were opposed to, took Paul to task, called him to Jerusalem and questioned him, why are you doing this, why are you doing that? That's what's even recorded in the Gospels to today and the writings, the letters of Paul. Let's talk about the uniqueness of this name Islam compared to what the other religions are named after. Well, the other religions tend to be named after people, mm -hmm. you know, the Jews, or they may be named after a particular person, Buddhists, Buddhism from Buddha. Yeah. Or they're named after a place, Hinduism from the Indus Valley. You know, they're connected to peoples, persons, places. Whereas Islam means submission to the will of God. The name of the religion is the central pillar, the basic concept the essence of the religion. That's what it refers to. Muslim is not the name of a person. It's the name of one who does Islam. Right? It is the, what they call the present participle. You know, one who does that act of Islam or submission is called a Muslim. So the name of the religion is found in the text, in the holy text. Right? You cannot find Hinduism in the Hindu texts. You cannot find Buddhism in the Buddhist text. You not, cannot find Christianity in the Christian text. It's mm -hmm. not there. But the, Jesus called his followers Christians. No, this was Paul. He's the one who invented that name. So is it safe to say that Jesus, peace be upon him, if he was alive today, did he ever hear this word Christian? If Moses was alive today, did he ever hear this term to be, would he be labeled a Jew or would he be labeled a Christian? Or would he be labeled a Muslim? All of the prophets would have been labeled Muslims because this essential message was the same message, submission to the will of God. Beginning with Adam, what was the command that he was given? The command he was given was to submit to the will of God. Don't eat from that tree. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's the essence of all that. You know? That was the essence of the religion. You can eat from all of the other trees, quite similar to the one, but this one here, don't eat from it. Mm -hmm. Submission. Will you submit or not? And that's Islam. That is Islam. So yeah. that's why we say that Islam is the original religion. One cannot claim Christianity was a religion of Adam. No way. Can one cannot claim Judaism or Buddhism or any other of the isms, but we can claim, maybe you don't accept it, that's another issue, but we can claim that Islam was the religion of Adam and Eve. That was the religion which God revealed to them. They were commanded to submit to the will of God. And that is what Islam means. So when, when the first man, Adam, he disobeyed and he ate from this tree, was this tree, was it beautified for him that he was lured into this? And then at, when he did this, was he forgiven afterwards? Well, the reality as it is recorded in the Quran, is that after Adam and Eve ate and they sought forgiveness from God, because of course, for God to have put them in a situation like that, yeah. knowing full well that they were going to eat, God knew ahead of time they were going to eat. So for him not to have given them a route and a way to remove the sin from themselves would have been unfair. Unjust. Unjust. So he gave them that knowledge, mm -hmm. how to repent if you sin. So when they realized that they had sinned, they repented. And so the sin was removed from them. That's why the process of repentance is in the hands of each and every individual. It's not a special priest cast class that they're the ones who do forgiveness. You have to go and sit in a booth and 
make confess your sins and then the the priest comes out and says your sins are forgiven that's not the way you know it doesn't work that way yeah. how your sins are forgiven when some of these priests are committing more sins than the people who are confessing their sins yeah you know there's human being so forgiveness belongs only to god that's the essence of religion and that god will accept that forgiveness from whomsoever turns to him sincerely with a repentant heart god will forgive them no matter how great the sin is he's the most merciful the most loving all we got to do is turn to him alone exactly simple it's logical simple. Rational. and that's the way the religion of god should be it should be a simple rational logical religion it shouldn't have you know as you said mental gymnastics as a pillar for you to be a, a follower you got to be a mental gymnast you know how to make three one and one three no we just deal with one one that's it a few more points bef before we come to an end so much to talk about so little time tell us now is the same concept that happened with adam i'm interested to know is that what was beautified or however he went off and slipped today many of the things that we're supposed to stay away from the fornication the adultery the alcohol and the drugs it seems like that is just beautified today well so exactly is that the trick of the the that's the one devil? of the methodologies of satan and in the quran addresses that specifically is saying that you know satan and actually even satan makes that open statement recorded in the quran yeah. that i will beautify for them ah you know so that's what i'm the yeah the, i will beautify for them corruption, corruption so that they would accept it and that's exactly what he did with the tree he came to adam and he told them that this tree is the tree of life of eternal life so he made it beautiful i mean before that adam wasn't thinking about eternal life you know <laughs> short life etc eternal life yeah, yeah i need some of that <laughs> you know I, yeah who doesn't want to be eternal I, I need a piece of that yeah so what he made it seem is that of all the trees in in, in the uh in the whole of the garden this is the one tree he had to eat from yeah big, and that's is not exactly what's happening now we're doing the, the media makes the corruption seem like these things our life is incomplete if we have not experienced and tasted this thing, our life is, well, you know, life is just not fulfilled unless we get to this thing. And these things that we are chasing after, which have been beautified for us, are corruption. Things which are harmful to us as individuals, harm to our societies without a shadow of a doubt. Has the truth always from the beginning been opposed? Because you'll see a stigma attached to this truth. What we claim is from the creator of the heavens and the earth. Has it always been the way during Moses' time, Jesus' time, all the prophets? Has there been an opposing force, force to try to lure people away from the correct way? Absolutely. It began with Adam and Satan and will not end until the end of this world and all that is living in it dies and is resurrected. The satanic forces will always be there throughout this life, as long as this world is functioning, it will be there. It has been from the very beginning, it will remain there till the end. And this is a part of the challenge and the test. Will we submit our wills to God or will we submit our wills to Satan and his forces? Who plays on our desires, plays on our, uh, our needs, mm -hmm. you know, turns them into things which are alluring to us, mm -hmm. but in fact, harmful to us. So, this process is a never-ending process. We just have to be conscious of it. We have to open up and, and wake up to know what's really happening. We have only two minutes for those there might have been a Muslim, one who is consciously submitted to the Creator, and now he has a non-Muslim sitting next to him. And you know what? Now what you're saying is lo logical, rational, it makes sense. And now all that person has to do, what's already naturally in him, help give that encouragement for the person that's read about Islam. He knows is the truth. But you know what? The devil comes up and says, you know what? You're going to forsake the religion of your forefathers and all the other doubts that start creeping in. How could we encourage them to do the right thing? And what are the benefits of doing the right thing, submitting to God? Well, the benefits 
are the eternal life that we are all seeking. Mm -hmm. Eternal life in a beautiful and a good and a pure sense. One in a state where we are at peace with God, God pleased with us and us with him. I mean, what better state can we be in? That is paradise. So that reward and that goal that we should all have can only be achieved through submitting ourselves to the will of God, known so, as Islam. Nice. That is the bottom line. And without it, no matter what we accumulate of this world, it will be ultimately of no benefit. It won't last, and we can't take it with us. None of it. It all stays behind. Yeah. Others benefit. Michael Jackson died. Bruce Lee died. We'll die too. Exactly. The pharaohs died. Yeah. We're still looking at their bodies and their wealth. Uh -huh. Didn't benefit them at all. You have an Islamic website. You have a website where people can go and seek knowledge and learn. Can you please tell the people about this wonderful site before we come to an end? Well, we have a site known as islamiconlineuniversity.com. Spell it all out, islamiconlineuniversity.com. There, there are free courses, and most of them are by me, but there are others, uh, other scholars whose work is up there, and we're adding more and more material. You can go there and freely access basic information about Islam in a course, an organized, and, 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 and we could say educationally sound, uh, structured uh, system. You know, because oftentimes people try to learn, you're learning, reading this book, that book, the other book, here, there, and all over the place. And when in the end, after one year, two years, three years, you look at what knowledge you have, and it just doesn't seem to come together, you know, because it's, it's scattered. Whereas what we need is a structured program of learning. And that's what the Islamic Online University, the IOU, you know, provides. And inshallah, we're working on upgrading that to BA level courses at either minimum expense or completely free. I'd like to thank you. May God Almighty Allah, the creator of the heavens and earth, reward you for being with us. It's always a pleasure. Alhamdulillah. It's my pleasure to be with you and hope to see you many more times in the future. Yes, Inshallah. thank you, thank you. And thank you very much for tuning in to The Dean Show. We're here every week to help you understand the way of life of all the messengers. And that's that way, that way of submitting yourself not to a man, not to a woman, the, but the one who created man and woman, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one Jesus prayed to, the one Moses prayed to, the one all the messengers of God submitted themselves to, and the last and final messenger sent to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. If you want to accept this way, if you want to do it now, if you want to learn more, call the number on the screen, 1-800-662-ISLAM. Come back here every week to the Dean Show. We'll see you next time. God willing, assalamu alaikum, peace. Be unto you. The DVDs for Dawah, as Allah has said in the Quran in Surah Naho 16125, invite all to the way of your Lord with wisdom, beautiful preaching, and reason with them in ways that are best. And this is a great opportunity for you to take up the obligation, take up the call as Allah has told you to do, and share this beautiful message with the world. Islam, submission to the one God. Come and see what everyone's talking about. If you find one contradiction, it can't be from God. But the rational idea, the rational explanation is, you do your best. Give up worshiping God is one. I will never give up spreading this message. I hope that you take that necessary step. You don't know if you're going to live till tomorrow. So you got to find that urgency to do the right thing right now. If you say that you do not believe in Jesus, you have stepped outside of Islam. You cannot be a Muslim. It has attended our faith to... It's cold, it's late, everybody's sleeping. I arise and ask Allah to forgive me. Oh Allah, you see. Oh Allah, you know all the sins I do. I turn to you to forgive my sins and my heart. 
I'm your sinful slave. You're my loving Lord. I'm the one who runs away. Oh, Allah, guide me.